Hey, Theo, over here. Good day, Robert. Theo, how are you? Too good, mate. Living the dream. That's nice to hear. What's up? I hear that Mike is out of the picture. Does that mean his position is open? I think he has recovered. Anthony, Paul and I got a nasty note for taking his cameras while he was under the weather. Damn. I knew I should have used a stronger mix in his beer. Sorry? What was that? Oh, nothing. I was going to apply for the job. Just glad he is all better. Yeah, it would be terrible to have to conduct all these interviews for a replacement. Oh, look, I think everyone is here. I can hear the music cued. Welcome to episode 44 of the Camerosity Podcast, the world's number one open source film photography podcast. My name is Mike Ekman, and I'm back. Contrary to popular rumors, I am not dead. However, I am still strangely trying to locate some missing cameras that I thought I had brought with me to the last recording. Starting us off from the Gainesville, Florida Regional United States Postal Service office is Mr. Anthony Rowe. Have you got any packages yet today? No. <laughs> we'll get to that in a second, but... No. Next, from the state of Ohio, which is well known as the state with many train wrecks, is Mr. Paul Reibel. How is the drinking water by you? The drinking water here is, is uh, if you like PCBs, it's, it's excellent. Very refreshing. Also, a recent new homeowner is Mr. Theo Panagopoulos. Where are you going to be moving to, Theo? Oh, I'll be in a different part of Australia, way, way, way from Sydney. A bit rural, but that's still a few years down the track. And finally, we are happy to have with us a special guest host. All the way from downtown Chicago, home of Ed DeBevix and Connie's Pizza, is Mr. Dan Tamarkin. How have things been going at the shop, Dan? <laughs> Just fine. Thank you so much. I'm so glad to be here. All right. So last episode, 43, was our Grayflex episode, one in which I was unable to participate. Uh, as it would turn out, I did not die. We recorded that intro like five days after we recorded the show. Uh, I had a wicked uh, ear infection and strep throat, and it was just painful for me to talk. So the guys had what turned out to be our most successful episode we've ever done. We broke every <laughs> record we possibly could in first week listen. So apparently you all have spoken, and what you want to hear is less of me. Or at least you dying in the middle of an episode, mate. Yeah, some some imminent peril to me, at least at some point. So uh, we'll try to deliver on what people are telling us they want to hear. For this episode, though, we kind of thought we've had a lot of themed episodes the last few in a row. We've talked about Pentax for two separate episodes. We've talked about contacts, uh, American cameras. We had Phil Sterrett and Mike Reitzma, two very knowledgeable guys on Argus. And we talked about Grayflex last week with like 19 different people. So for this one, the guys and I thought, let's just talk about some of the stuff that we've been doing lately. Uh, share with you some things we've been shooting, what we're working on. Uh, we invited Dan because Dan's a great friend of the show. He's been on a couple of times before, always interesting. And we thought he'd be able to contribute to a topic we would like to discuss a little bit later. Dan Tamarkin is known for his like uh, purchases and, and the equipment that he comes up with. But Dan, if you couldn't have a Leica, what is your, what, what's your favorite camera to shoot with that isn't a Leica? Oh, that's a great question. My favorite camera to shoot with that isn't a Leica is a Fuji six. Uh, wait, it's not a six four five. It's a it's a Fuji medium format camera that's a has a vertical viewfinder. I can't think of the name it's of it. It's a G six forty five. G six forty five. That's it. GS six forty five. I love that thing. It's got a sixty millimeter Fujinon something or other f four lens. It's fabulous. I love the viewfinder's vertical, which I thought mm -hmm. was really interesting. Um, I must say it's been a while since I put a roll through that bad boy, but uh, that's probably my, now if I didn't are, if I didn't already have that, you know, I held one of those Zeiss icon range finders recently that they made um, in the, I think the late nineties up until just a few years ago, maybe five or six, five, four or five or six years ago, they discontinued them. Um, what a terrific camera. So I think I would have to go with like, it's kind of a cheat, but I'm going to go with the Zeiss camera. There was a guy on, uh, he just posted it on Facebook Marketplace. I saw it today. Well, Fuji GF670, which is the folder 670 camera. So it's yes. a six by seven folder, like a Machina, except it's it's uh, slightly different the way the bellows work. It's a it's a drop bed type thing rather than the Machina, which pulls completely pulls out. out. Right, yeah. right, right. 
I got to say, I have a camera lust for the wide angle version of the plowable machina. The, you have one? Oh, I'm so envious. I lo- <laughs> that thing is awesome. Now, they made another one. I've only ever held that camera once. That's an amazing camera. They made another one that's just like a slab, and it's a 6.7. Yep. The yeah. W6.7. See, if it's not Leica, it's all, I'm just guessing at things, really. No, it's a plowable 67W. Yeah, and it's like a big slab of camera. And right. the, it's like you were talking about, the, the bellows pop straight out. And it's got an 80 millimeter Nikkor, I think 2.8. And then the other one is a 55 Nikkor. That's hard to, harder to find and typically more expensive. And I don't even remember what the F-stop is, but I don't even care. I, I would buy one of those if it came across my plate in a, mo- in a moment. There was one just sold at, uh, at uh, an auction that we were... We were bidding on it, and I was I was in it right up to the end. There was a, a the sixty seven, which is the uh, eighty millimeter two eight Nikkor, and then there was a six seventy W, which is the wide angle version. That one went for almost seventeen hundred dollars, which was actually cheap considering you know how much. I they, would if it's working, I yeah. would pay that in a heartbeat. Yeah, that was a good. That would have been a good buy at that price. Yeah, I think so too. The Zeiss Icon camera you're talking about, for anybody who doesn't know, this is a Cosina made rangefinder. Um, it was literally just called the Zeiss Icon. Some people call it the ZM. And do you have one, Dan? Or you just got a chance to hold one? I just, uh, one just came across in, in my field of view. And yeah, I just got to hold one. Yeah. yeah. It's a great camera. Yeah, I mean, I'm aware of them. I've seen pictures of them, but you know, knowing that they're in, in what I consider to be the unobtainium range for me, I, I haven't really looked looked into it much. But as you were talking about, it, I quickly brought it up here, and wow, what a cool looking camera! I thought at first it was just going to be like a rebadge of like the Bessa, the the Folklander right. Bessa, but it, right. it clearly isn't. It's got a really wide rangefinder base, so I'm assuming that that was inspired by the original contacts range finders which had a really wide base too uh it uses the leica m mount so it's you know it's going to support those lenses it says here that zeiss actually did make some new lenses for it in Obercoach in germany so um wow that is neat everybody that i know that has shot one has been just absolutely in love with that camera yeah wow well i gotta i gotta say that that dan's kind of given me a bit of an opening here <laughs> and that that i had to do a bit of a soul searching this last week you know, I recently, through our, our local resale store, uh, sort of blundered into a very nice 3F with a Simicron 50 collapsible. And I, I, I sent it off and had it CLA'd. And, you know, it's like shooting a brand new camera. Um, and it's really delightful. And then I, I've got my, uh, my Leica M3 that I also sort of blundered in through Facebook Marketplace with the original uh, Sumerit 50 1.5 which I got to say is probably the only Sumer at 51.5 that has never had a cleaning mark on it. Uh, it is absolutely spotless as clear wow. as a camera that came out of the patch last week. And, you know, I, I I've loved shooting these cameras and I, I put hundreds of, of frames through the, th- through the M3, but you know, at the end of the day, I've got so many 35 millimeter cameras and I'm probably never going to be able to afford another like a lens of the sort that I want. So I decided to do a bit of horse trading and I decided to go with a, uh, a, a fixed lens viewfinder camera. So I no longer own any Leica at all, but oh. instead I have this and I'm holding up. What in the F is that thing? Is that a that is the food? That's the Fuji G617. Look at that monster. It's a 120 panorama camera um, with a fixed Fujinon 105 f8 lens wow it gets it gets four frames per roll of 120 eight frames if you've got 220 it does support 220 oh yeah you have a couple rolls there don't you still oh yeah yeah i've got i've got probably 50 rolls of 220 wow but i am now in the medium format panorama game (laughs) uh wow so out of the leica game into the large format or medium format panorama that is so quite I, a move. Congratulations. If anybody's been wondering where Paul 617 went, it's it's right here in Florida. No, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Paul. <laughs> I got his Leicas. <laughs> you, 
<laughs> hold on, hold on. So Paul made a post. He we have a private chat, and he posted this in the group about how one of the greatest mistakes of his life was selling the first six seventeen he had, right? And then you got this one, and within like what a day? Uh, it was it was about three days. <laughs> three days. <laughs> I guess it's a good problem to have, though. So I, I have to imagine, even though those are desirable, it probably is easier for you to move Anthony's 3F than it would be to move this thing, right? Or, or my- Yeah, I, it was a 3F and a, a 50 Sumer yeah. and an M3 and a 1.5 Sumerit and some other. And Anthony's stuff is always good condition. I mean, it's always, it was, it was ready, to, ready to move. So Yeah, the, the M3 had been uh, CLA'd by, by DAG and it's as close to being a brand. It's a double. It's the very. It's like the very end of the run of the double stroke. It's you know the. It's as crisp as could be. It's like shooting a brand new camera. The the rangefinder patch in it is just is probably better than any camera I'd ever had. They are if nice. I remember correctly, that one's the, the one that had, actually came with a filter as well, isn't it? Yeah. Well, no, I had the. the uh, which one? The the M three. No, no, the six seventeen. Yes. Oh yes, 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 oh. yes. The yes, center weighted. Um, it's got the center weight and neutral density filter yeah 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 those cameras are so wide angle that you got to use a center spot filter with them right to prevent getting you got a hot spot in the middle can you describe kind of how it looks anthony i mean we'll have pictures in the show notes but like try do a quick verbal description of this thing talk about a slab i mean you have to remember that the the negative is six by 17 so it's you know over twice as wide or it's twice as wide as the six by nine roughly uh so the back of the camera has to be that wide so you're holding a camera that's uh, i'd say it's what 12 13 inches wide and uh, a good two and a half inches thick it's made out of metal it has a big honking uh panoramic viewfinder that's on it's since it's a fixed lens camera it's got a fixed uh viewfinder on the top and then it has what looks like it could be on any uh large format camera it's got this 105 lens uh and it's it's f8 and it's got the uh uh the shutter cocks at the end of the of the uh shutter at the end of the 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 the, the lens right before the final element and then it's got the, the that fuji roll cage around it to protect the lens right like the six four fives have that yeah. i think the six sevens do too and then it, and then it's got a, it's got like a, a thumb winder on it and it takes about three strokes to wind between frames it's 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 incredibly simple and robust. It's kind of interesting. This one has it's got the uh you know it's got the actuation count on the bottom of it, and this one's had six hundred and fifty actuations. And I was looking at the manual, and Fuji was talking about how uh you know this 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 lens is so robust and it's it's all manual, and you probably won't need to have the 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 lens serviced until you hit ten thousand actuations. Wow, uh, which is a lot of rolls of uh, four frames each of one twenty. Um, you said fixed lens, but did you also say fixed focus or does it, is it's it a focusing lens? lens? No, it's focus, it focuses. Yeah. Okay. Um, but you know, the hyperfocal on it is, is wide. Yeah. So, you know, if you can shoot it at, at F16 or F22, it focuses from like four meters to infinity. Okay. The, the angle of view on that lens is equivalent to 25 millimeter on 35 millimeter camera. I so gotcha. it's a wider, it's a wider angle. And I've shot, I've, I raced out yesterday because it showed up on Saturday because I was, I've been, well, I might as well talk about it. I, I've got a camera coming from Theo. Uh, you know, one of my, my white whales has been the, the Voigtlander Superb, the TLR from the 1930s. And Theo came across two in an auction in New Zealand, I believe. Yes, that's correct. And he kept the nicer one for himself, but he was kind enough to have it shipped off to our friend Jess, um, who overhauled both of ours. And he shipped it from Australia along with some Vegemite. And it has been the most torturous postal experience. It took it almost three weeks to leave Australia. And then when it finally left, it, it like quickly went through UPS or USPS tracking in LA, cleared customs, and then just vanished into the ether where it just said in transit to the next destination for three weeks. It has just been in transit to the next destination. And then on Saturday, the same day that Paul's camera was supposed to show up, it suddenly I get a uh, a ping from the the tracking software that it's out for delivery in Gainesville. The superb's out for delivery as well, but the superb it never shows up. They never deliver it. They mark it as no. It just just says undelivered, and then it just falls off the tracking system. 
And I went down today to talk to them about this, to remind them that they should have delivered it on Saturday, like they said. And they basically assured me, oh, I'm I'm positive it's on the truck and it'll be out for delivery today. And of course, nothing. So I've got no Jeez. way of tracking it. And then Theo got a, a an automated note from the Australian Postal Service indicating that it may have been sent back to Australia as undeliverable. <laughs> and I mean, and this is literally the post office branch is five blocks from the, my business where it was to be delivered. I mean, literally, I, I so would walk there in 15 yeah. minutes and pick it up. You know, they, they, they could be blackout drunk and still deliver it to me because uh, it's so close. It's literally three stoplights, take a right, and you're at my shop. And they've probably driven past your place with it in the truck. I, but we haven't seen the truck once since, since Saturday. Driving they, by, looking for the numbers. You got the number? <laughs> you got the number? And driving by, they can't see the number. Anthony owns a a, a, a high-end uh, coffee shop. I don't really shouldn't call it a coffee shop because it's much more than that. But what you really need to do is is put a sign up, you know, U.S. <laughs> best workers drink free. All right. There you go. But yeah. We're, we're in a building that's owned by the city of Gainesville. The, the, the police substation shares a wall with us. I mean, it's not like we're some sort of hidden, yeah. uh, you know, entity here. It's like they have to drive by it on the street. Yeah. It's just, it's just been really frustrating that, that yeah. I, I'd, I'd really hope to be able to share the, the superb uh, and post photos of, of it. But that said, out shooting with this has more than made things better. I mean, this this totally improved my week. And I shot a roll of black and white and a, and a, and a roll of color through it already. And I got to admit that four frames is 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 kind of intense, you know, because you're looking at like I I uh, you know loaded up a roll of color plus, and even as a cheap color film, it's like twelve dollars a roll, you know. So it's like almost the same price as shooting four by five. So, so here's a question for you then. I've shot, now it's funny you bring this up because I, for people listening, I had no idea he had this camera with him. And without even me standing up, I'll show you a camera that I, I just started shooting again. I have the Noblex 135S. So uh, it, other than it being panoramic, it's really not, not at all like Anthony's. It's a swing lens, it's 35 millimeter. But I will say this though, that my experience of the panoramic cameras, I had borrowed your Horizon, uh, Anthony. And since then I've gotten one of my own. Um, I have that weird Soviet F21, that little box panoramic camera that shoots 105 millimeter wide images. Um, I've shot an X-Pan before, uh, one of those Minolta, um, I think it's called the PS. It's like a fixed lens, 24 millimeter panoramic camera. And, and a question I have for you is, you can't just point a panoramic camera at just some rando thing and waste all that extra real estate. So like, how do you go about framing? I mean, other than horizons, like anybody can stand in a field and take a picture of a horizon, but something a little bit more interesting that how do you find an image that you think is worthwhile of a panoramic shot? Cause you know, you gotta be discriminant, right. With only four exposures to roll. So you want to, you want to make the most of your shots, right? It's so like, how do you go about selecting what you take a picture of? And how close to the alligator do you get? <laughs> is that, is that a loaded question or did we lose Anthony? Anthony People might be frozen. Anthony. Oh no. Anthony froze up. Anthony's dead. Everybody still has Anthony's cameras. Dead. I want the, I get the Fuji back. <laughs> am i still frozen there no. you go okay how much um, of my question did you hear I, I heard the whole thing and i but i missed what theo said something about the gator well, so, and how close do you have to get to the gator with pretty close camera? well <laughs> let me first say that well i'll say two things about it one is one way to think about this camera as opposed to the other panoramic cameras is this is basically um a hulked out version of the x-pan because it's it's a flat field yeah, you know, negative. So it's not the swing lens. So you don't get those sort of crazy distortions that you can get with the swing lens, which I think are charming. I mean, I always wanted a wide lux as well, but I'm going to stick with this. So it's basically like it's, it's like it's like an X pan on steroids. But that also carries through in that I think it's much easier to shoot with handheld because on the swing lens cameras, you know, you have to hold it steady while the the lens is swinging around. Right. Right. And you can get distortions, especially if you shoot at the lower uh, shutter speeds, which just means that the turret is moving more slowly. Right. This, I actually shot an entire roll handheld with it uh, because it's got a really cool, it's got the, the the bubble level that you can see through the viewfinder. And so you can kind of slowly rotate it back and forth until you see that you're perfectly dead center level. 
then it's got a, a, a shutter button on the top or on the front. So, I mean, you just, you're holding on to it, you get it straight and you're done. So it's much, it lends itself much more to being handheld. Now, as far as how I compose, I think part of it is that I spent most of my life writing and teaching film history and film theory in which I see things in Panavision, right? You know, when I think about things, you know, when I think about who influences how I compose for photography, I'm thinking as much about like a Sergio Leone film as I am about Henry Cartier-Bresson, you know? So uh, I kind of think in, in wide screen and for years, you know, up until like when I used to do gallery shows, um, I would always crop my 35 millimeter frames to be Panavision aspect ratio. So even when I was shooting 35, I was thinking about how to compose in widescreen. Anthony, do you mean 16.9? Yes. So that's that's 185 to 1? Yes, that, that sounds right. Okay, and then CinemaScope was what, 235, 2.35 to 1? That's the yeah. super wide? Yeah, okay. So, but you think about, you think about like what, you think about like the, the, the spaghetti westerns that were shot in, in CinemaScope. And how they would play with like foreground and background and left, right. And, you know, I, that's how I like to shoot these cameras, you know, okay. and they've got enough hyperfocal distance that, you know, you can have somebody four feet away and still have infinity and focus. I read somewhere, someone talking about that exact thing, like kind of, and, and you bring up an interesting point about composing it like it's a movie. And if you're good at it, like you said, you just see that way. So you, I think you kind of have a leg up on somebody else. Like I really struggle with six by six because I do not see the world in squares, you know? And I feel like when I take like a TLR, I'm still composing it like a rectangular image with just extra information above and below. And, and that's fine. I can crop it out, but you know, I, I, I don't shoot a lot of six by six because I can't see that way, but I've also seen people who are really, really good at composing in a square image, but you've gone the complete like opposite end of the spectrum and I had read somewhere someone talking about how, you know, like you, you can make any picture of any aspect ratio tell a story. You can tell stories with your images. But when you have an ultra wide angle like that, you can almost have a story, uh, a subject on the left and a subject on the right, you know, frame your people uh, a little bit further apart or have a subject near on one side of your image and something further away. And when done correctly, it's amazing, you know, but you have to have that that vision, like you said, that you have, I think, to be able to do that consistently. And if you don't, then you feel bad every time you press shutter release. Like, oh, shit, <laughs> that was a quarter of a roll of film. <laughs> yeah. With a 617 and a 25 millimeter lens, you're not quite as, that's a that's not that wide. This camera is a 6 by 9 format, but it's a 47 millimeter lens. That's the plow bow shift for people. Your listening. angle of view here is is 90 degrees. So, I mean, it's really wide angle. So when you go to compose, you have to be very careful with it because otherwise you wind up with, uh, your image size is too small. Your, your subject matter is too small inside the frame. So the, the first rule of, of photography for me is fill the frame. You know, get your subject. Right. You, you don't want, you don't want, you want to be, have a, a perspective that is pleasing to the to the subject itself. And uh, an ultra wide angle lens, it's tough to do that with. You've got to have something that makes it work. So I can get this right in my head because I've never used the six by 17. Um, and I'm kicking myself because a friend of mine had two of them and he sold them and I didn't buy one at the time, which was years ago. And it would have been a much better thing to do it back then. I've got the Mamiya 7, which I've recently got the 43 millimeter lens for, which... I know, Dan, earlier you mentioned the Makina 6x7. This is probably the, the closest competitor. To me, to me, it's the preferred one because it's it's very more Leica, Leica-liked, um, rangefinder, changeable yeah. lenses, etc. It also comes with a panoramic kit, which shoots X-Pan format, which is 24 by 65 and it's native too. So you, you're not actually having to do like adapters and changing it in dark bags and so on. It's, you, and you know, you, you attach a little wine thing and you can wind the film back in and all, all that sort of stuff. Um, and I've also used an X-Pan with a 45 millimeter lens and that's, that's fairly wide on those cameras. When we say 25 millimeters on the six by 17, are we saying that it's, much wider than that 43 millimeter because i'm trying to do the comparisons here in my head no it wouldn't be as wide the 43 millimeter lens on a six by seven is going to be roughly 90 degrees angle of view right be very close to that a 38 millimeter on six by six is 90 degrees 
So 43 millimeter on six by seven would be almost almost 90 degrees. The six the 25 millimeter on 617 is going to be um, about 72 degrees, 78 degrees, somewhere in that neighborhood. So it isn't nearly as wide angle as as your 43 would be on the 67. Okay. Right. Okay. Okay. Because I, I must admit, when I do put that pano kit in, and uh, I haven't had it that long, I've had it since Christmas, it is actually something I struggle with to actually get a good perspective in terms of the frame I'm trying, trying to get. It, it is something I'm not used to. So um, unfortunately, unlike Anthony, I don't have that background. in. in... Well, and, and I don't either. And and what you're talking about is, has been my challenge because like Anthony loaned me his Horizon and I struggled to finish the role because I like, again, I felt bad. Like I'm not using this thing correctly. And I've had this no blacks. I actually did shoot a role in it once already and I got okay images from it. I, I was up at Mackinac Bridge in Northern Michigan. So you have a huge bridge, like that's perfect for a panoramic camera. But like once I got away from the bridge, like I I feel like I needed to almost like get a book of panoramic photography and like sort of be inspired. Or maybe I'll just look at Anthony's pictures when he's done. But Theo, it it sounds to me like you and I have the same kind of hang up mm. that I, I'm not good at visualizing an effective panoramic image. And that kind of makes me a little gun shy in using some of these cameras, even though they're awesome. Yeah. My, my default format that I like the best is six by seven. And you probably couldn't get further away from six by seven to panoramic right. because six by seven is, is almost square at that point. Well, I'm curious, Dan, are you, do you primarily shoot 35 millimeter or, or digital equivalent? Yeah. Almost exclusively. Almost exclusively. How, what, do you shoot any film at all anymore? Or are you, Oh yeah. Um, do you? Yeah. 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 I shoot, uh, one of my, I got a couple of cameras on the other side. I'm shooting a, a Leica two, with a 50 millimeter lens right now. And also uh, some other camera I just loaded up with film at the office to film test it. I don't remember what it is. Maybe a, a 3A or 3B, something like that. Okay. So uh, on your, in, in your, in your, I don't want to call it a shop because I, it's far more than that. What do, what does the percentage of film versus digital? Do you shoot, do you sell a lot more digital than you do film or is it? It ebbs and it flows right now people are buying more digital cameras but we have we field way more inquiries for film cameras so i think that what's happening is you know we what we do is we sell cameras that have already been cla'd and are all ready to go and they're working and warrantied and we charge appropriately a lot of cameras out there are maybe just as good, but maybe not just as good. And they're really tempting to people when they're four, five, six, seven hundred dollars less. I total I totally get it. So I think that right now with the resurgence of film, as it's been happening, it's all kind of like, you know, arcs and uh, peaks and valleys and, you know, uh, sine, sine and cosine. That's the one I was thinking of. But, you know, I failed math all seven years of high school. <laughs> uh, uh, but, but my point is that there is film is really, really popular right now, so much that that supply is not meeting with demand at all. However, for cameras, it really ebbs and it flows. Lately, the last three or four months, it's been mainly digital. Is it like, uh, you know, interchangeable digital Leicas or yeah. are you like yeah. the deluxes? You know, every now and then somebody walks in and wants one of those things. They're, they're terrific cameras. Okay. We, I... <laughs> I have two V-Lux cameras on my shelf and they've been there for a year and a half. A terrific camera, year and a half. I have a C-Lux that I'm actually selling, I think below my cost or I'm trying to sell below my cost. Nobody cares. The D-Lux is the one to have if it's going to be any of them. It's a right. terrific camera. So that's the that's something that we we sell a fair amount of. It's not like, not as much as the M stuff. I mean, that's what we're really known for. So M screw mount vintage and collectible and also sl you know and, and and some of the other interchangeable stuff we sell a fair amount of and it's terrific stuff but mainly we're known for m so when you say on the m like the m m8s m9s are you have you done anything with i mean how how cautious are you on m9s right now because of the sensor oh i'm not cautious at all all m8s all m9s they come in they got to go to Leica. see what Leica says Okay. That's what it is. And then the same is true for those cameras that they made that without a screen. 
the digital cameras yeah. enabled yeah. on a screen. Yeah. So you can connect it to your photos app, but like, I can't really evaluate the camera unless I can look at the sensor and clean the sensor. And perhaps that can be done on the photos app, but uh, I'm not trusting my Bluetooth connection while my shutter is open and a swab is on the sensor. So those cameras, M8, M9, and, and M, M8 platform and M9 platform and D platform. So like M10D, there was some other D cam. There were a couple of D cameras don't have screens on the back of them. And they're awesome cameras, but they just, they have to go to Leica. And um, Leica offers a trade up program. And so they have a prescribed value if they do have bad sensors or if they have problems that can't be worked on. For example, the M8, they work on the M8, they just don't have any more screens. So if the screen, LCD screen, so if the LCD screen needs to be replaced, this is my understanding. This isn't the gospel. This is my understanding as of today. If they need a new screen, they can't do anything with it. And they don't have an upgrade program for the M8. But for the M9 and M9 platform cameras, they do. Okay, so they, they okay, they, they won't repair, they won't replace the sensors on the M9, but they will do a trade up on them. They do a trade up on them. And last I heard, you could get, again, this isn't a gospel. This is just as I remember the memo, you can get an M10, you can get an M11, you can get a Q2, you can get an SL2 with an M adapter. I think that's the, that's but usually, but that's what they do, something like that. And if you subtract the amount of money that that costs from the brand new product cost, you wind up with what, what is ultimately the trade-in value for that camera. Okay, right. Well, I had a, an M9. It's been about, say, eight or nine months ago that it had the original sensor in it. So yeah. it made me nervous about what I was going to do with it. I didn't want to sell it because I was I was concerned that it would... I, I, the sensor was fine. I mean, there was no no signs of any... Yeah. delamination or any problem with the, the the glass but i sent it i actually contacted clary vision oh yeah sure they do the, they do the replacements yeah. and uh, i had talked to him about it i decided i would sell it on ebay as is you know with the understanding that it had the original sensor there was no problem in it right and clary vision bought it so they, uh, but when they got it, they got it. They emailed me back and said, you know, the sensor on this is fine. It, it there has no signs of any delamination, but you can't count on that. So, I mean, it's too bad too, because the M9 was actually a nice camera. It was a fantastic camera. And, yeah. And you, you said the last episode we talked to you that you really like the M monochrome. I have one right here. Or, well, I don't know where my camera bag is, but it's around here somewhere. Yeah, I have. Yeah, I love it. It's magic. That camera is magic. I when they started swapping out sensors, I immediately I was like, <laughs> swap this one out. Yeah. And yeah. the guy at Leica, the head repair guy at Leica, called me up. He's like, I've never seen a sensor this bad. He's like, look, I'm gonna swap this sensor out with one that's not as bad as yours until we get a new batch of new sensors. I was like, sure, fine. And I was grateful for it. And so he swapped them out. I think he probably framed my sensor. <laughs> they were like, don't do whatever this guy did. But it, it was a mess. And eventually got, uh, my monochrome eventually got um, the new type non-corrodible sensor when I'm grateful. Can you explain a little bit, like what, how does the bad sensor like present itself? Like if I had an M8, like how would I know if mine's good or bad? Well, so firstly, it's it's primarily with the M9 cameras. M8s typically have, okay. M8s have different problems that are okay. easily, usually easily addressable. I mean, we just sent two M8s in to Leica. This is a digital camera that was made between, I think, 2006 and 2009, right? So this is an antique digital camera. For sure. You know, we sent them in to Leica to get a CLA and they're going to be on their way back. They're going to be working fine. The M9 platform cameras, the, on the sensor, in order to, I think, not have to have some sort of filter and to not have a moire effect, they put a very, very, very thin cover glass over the actual sensor, electronic part of the sensor. The cover glass is the part that you can see and the part that you can touch, although don't ever touch your sensor, the part that you would clean. Well, what happened was it was too thin. And so it achieved what they wanted to do, 
uh, this is a highly technical explanation, as you can tell. They That's achieved fine. what they wanted to do, but it left the sensor susceptible to this corrosion, which presents as little dots in the sky. So if you, if you shoot a clear blue sky at F-16 at the lowest ISO you can manage, which presumably would be 400 or 200, something like that. And you see these little amoeba looking things like little single cell, like little amoeba looking things, that's corrosion. Not every sensor has it, but it's a minor miracle if all these years later, uh, any camera didn't have it. Um, we gotcha. had, I'm not trying to sell anything, but I can't stop myself from saying, I, when they came out with the M type 240, which is the model after the M9, I still had an M9 on my shelf. Nobody wanted it. So I sent it back to Leica. I had the sensor changed and I kept it on my shelf. So I have a brand new M9 camera for sale with a brand new non-corrodible sensor. So anybody Very who's nice. got, uh, anybody who's got 99.50 to spend, give me a shout. All right. Or we can you can share it amongst us, and we can just promote your store all the time, mate. Right? That'd be great. Uh -huh. you, you know, we could, we could do like a timeshare. I was thinking about this; it'd be the M9 NFT. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I still want to try an M5. I, I of all the M film cameras, that's the one for some reason. I, I just really want to get my hands it. on the people. You know what they say? Like the kids say, "If you know, you know." The people who like that camera love that camera. And then there's all these other Leica people or just people in general who are like, oh, oh, the M5. Oh, it's a terrific camera. And the ticket is, well, if you get it CL8, if you get it serviced by, by somebody who knows what they're doing, you can buy any, any of them. But I think that it's after, uh, after number 135 XXXX, they're uh, uh, 1, 1, 350,000. They made some kind of improvement and then they have more longevity or something like that. I'm sure there's people on the internet who, who know more than I do about exactly what the problem was with the earlier M5s. It's actually a, it's a good user camera. Yeah. I went to the Leica school in 1986 and the only Leica I owned at that time was an M5. Yeah. And so I took it and it, I didn't really shoot with it much because they supplied us with M6s and M4Ps to use. Ooh. But you know, I, I had it and the, all the technicians in the factory, it was in Wetzlar at that time, the technicians all wanted to look at my M5 because, you know, it'd been, it was old enough for them. They weren't really that familiar with it. Right. It, it, it did have some, I mean, there's some idiosyncrasies about it where the, the flag would pop up when you put the lens on. On an M5, there's a little flag that comes down in front of the shutter to take your light meter reading. Right. When you take the lens off, that flag disappears. Whether the camera is wound or not. It that's doesn't right. matter. The flag is gone. That's right. When you put the lens on the camera or a body cap, the flag will then drop. So Right. Gets, if the camera's wound, the flag... It has to have a lens on it for the flag to be in place. So there, there are just enough little odd things about that camera that it, it makes it... Uh, well, the thing that I, I'm most excited to be able to try is it's got a feature that the Canon EF has and a few other cameras where the shutter speed wheel... Like it actually extends over the front edge of the camera. So when you, when you have your your right hand gripping the camera, your front your right index finger is resting on the shutter release. If you want to change shutter speeds, all you do is just kind of tilt your finger forward, and you can go left and right and change those speeds with it kind of resting on the front edge of the camera. And it it it's one of those things like you have to experience it to know. And I've never shot an M5, but the EF works the same way. Uh, the Nikon FG works the same way. There's a few other cameras where they put that shutter wheel right up to the front edge of the camera. And I just, I wish every camera did that. I, I just really, really, really... It's a great feature, Mike. Yeah. Right. And that's the only one that does that. Uh, well, on the M5 also, you can see the shutter speed in the sh in the viewfinder. That's one of the best parts about, about that viewfinder is yeah. that you can see that. That's terrific. You can see the shutter speed and also the... Uh, the needle, the match needle is, is yeah. a, a really good position. It's very easy to see. I think that at the time that that was introduced, it was, there was no question that that was the photographer's camera. I mean, it really had everything. It had absolutely everything that people wanted at that time. I think it was just, it was the best camera on the market. It was just kind of a dog because it didn't have the classic like a shape. And as it happens, there's a lot of 
small movable delicate parts not to mention a fickle meter but it was i mean at that time it was a terrific camera so was a like a victim of their own marketing at that point at wit at every point god bless yeah yeah, yeah. yeah that's the, the, until dr kaufman came in like right. made, uh, they made like a hundred consecutive bad business moves I mean, they they really did. They they were their own worst enemy on on so many marketing aspects of of the business. That's um, right. Dr. Kaufman really really turned things around. Well, he was a businessman, yeah. and 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 he wasn't. He what he he loved the camera, and that and it really showed because he put his money where his mouth is. Yep. He also was realistic about it, and uh, when when he took over, they it wasn't long before they were back in you know going the right direction. Yeah, well, it also helps to have uh, to be uh, partnered with Blackstone because if they see if they see profitability in your model, then if when they're in, you're like you're kind of you're in. Like that's a good. It's a really really good arrangement that they have, and you know the figures and the interest in the brand and and everything, the whole direction that Leica is heading. I think it really it's so different than it was when I, when I was younger and when I first started in the business, so different. So it, I'm, I'm glad to see it. I'm glad to see it. I think they're moving in the right direction. I really do. So Dan, one of the reasons that I really wanted you to come on is it's kind of been a weird season of auctions. Uh, and you know, um, the internet means that, that anybody with an auction house can, can, can reach a bigger audience than they used to. And there are, there are auctions of, of, different levels of uh, uh, professionalism, I guess you could say. And sure. I know that, um, you know, you run your auction and I know that I, you were posting photos on your Instagram of, of going to the Illinois auction convention. Uh, yep. Yeah. You got your, you've got your, your branded shirt I'm on. representing. That's right. And so I was just wondering if, if, uh, if you could give us some like sort of behind the scenes of what it's like running a camera auction, because I know that you have to, I mean, you have to solicit cameras and deal with some probably very idiosyncratic buyers and sellers. So I was just wondering if there is any sort of behind the scenes that you can give us of what it's like running your auction and, and, and uh, so any, if there are any stories from the background of, uh, of what it's like. Well, I will, I will tell you that I, the, 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 I had a first, this past auction, I had a first, I've never had a bidder bid against him or herself. And that, so that was kind of an interesting situation to manage. How does that happen? Well, you can thank the inner, the interwebs for that. So I think that this gentleman was a little confused about, because we had him on the phone. We had him on the phone and he was on the computer. And I think he didn't realize exactly what bid was being taken. And I felt bad for him, but I real and I didn't let it get out of hand. As soon as I realized what was going on, I stopped accepting the other the other bids. And of course, he won the item because he was both the high and the low bidder. So, he, <laughs> so, so wait a minute. He so can't he's, lose. He, he's talking to you, and you're like, "Nope, you were outbid." He, so he kept telling you to raise it, but then he was on the computer bidding it also. Well, yeah, basically, in, in, in a nutshell, yes. I mean, it wasn't me he was talking to. So I'm basically, right. I have, you know, I have ring men. I've got ring people who are on the phone with people or who are looking in the crowd or, who you know, mm -hmm. are are helping me to, to make sure that I don't miss any bids. Frankly, that's what they do. So, and I, as soon as I get bids in, whether they're on the floor or they're on the phone, I register them and sell each auction lot. So the, the first thing, and so I, I don't know exactly how it happened with this gentleman, but I, at one point I kind of like paused everything. And I looked at the gal that was on the phone with this person. And I said, you have bidder number what now? And I just kind of like triangulated everything and realized that this person's bidding against themselves. And I just said, sold. And we just sold it. Ah, uh, okay. So. Are, are are your auctions primarily live auctions? Do you I'm do glad you asked. I'm I'm glad you asked, Paul, because that's one of the distinctions that I want to make. Not that it makes a big difference. Auctioneering is auctioneering, but uh, live auctions versus online auctions may be different. And what I mean by that is sometimes online auctions take a, a span of time and they end on a day. And I guess live auctions do the same thing. The bidding may open online, but it ends on the day of the live auction. And so 
it, it's really important to look at the terms and conditions and the buyer's premium and shipping and and really get your arms around exactly what the auctioneer is gonna gonna require of you if you do register a winning bid because sometimes i get people who are surprised gee i didn't know there was a 20 percent premium or you know uh i thought it was all i i thought you know this stuff is is working and ready to go i'm like it's a hundred year old camera it's not working so it, it's really important to understand the the scope of the auction uh, what's being advertised, how it's being advertised, what the condition is, what the buyer's premium and other stipulations of the auction are, because there are almost always um, fees associated with an auction. I know you do a catalog. You do a great catalog. Thank you. But when if, if your auction is primarily live, though, you know, bidders can call in and, and bid on the, the, uh, on the day of the auction. But you don't start yes. off like we, on a Monday and finish it on a Friday. No, it's one day. One day. It's one day. The online portion and the proxy bidding portion where people might fax or email me their bids, that occurs in the weeks, really in about four weeks leading up to the auction. So typically, if our auction this past year was in November 19th of 2022, and we like to open the online bidding about four weeks out. And so by the middle of October, and I would say October 16th or 17th, we opened the online bidding. Now nothing gets sold. People can bid and they can do, people can do whatever they can place bids. They can retract bids. They can do all the crazy bunker stuff that they do. And then on the day of the auction, when the lot comes up, it gets sold or it gets passed. If there's no interest, then, you know, it gets passed. So we, we typically sell, you know, 60 or so percent of the lots in the auction. It kind of depends on the year. It depends on what's being offered. The, the reason this is of some interest right now, and, and I, we, will, we will not mention any names of any auction companies or anything like that at this point. I, I, we don't need to do that. Fair but enough. You're probably aware there was a, there was a large photo auction that happened uh, several weeks ago uh, of a collector up in Northern Ohio. I tried to buy this collection, but it didn't, didn't happen for me. Well, there were... There was a lot of there's a lot of confusion in this auction because what happened was some of the lots were priced as a lot. So, for example, if there were four cameras, you made a bid, and the the price was whatever you bid for all four cameras. Other lots were priced individually. So, if there were ten cameras in the lot, whatever you bid was multiplied by ten. So, if, if for example, we have a friend who bought. Uh, bought some little cameras that were, you know, he bet a hundred dollars for 10 cameras. He did not realize he was actually bidding a thousand dollars for those 10 cameras. Have you ever huh. heard of an auction that worked that way? They called it a multiplier. There was a multiplier, but it wasn't yeah. across the board. It was only on certain lots. It was very inconsistent. Like it, it's not like all the cameras at the beginning had the multiplier and all the ones at the end didn't. Hmm. You literally had to keep opening them up. And, and it made no sense. You know, it, I've never seen that before, but I don't do a lot of non eBay auctions though either. Huh? Well, uh, first of all, <laughs> first of all, let me make some disclaimers. <laughs> I'm a licensed auctioneer in the state of Illinois, and I don't know about any other state's laws. Okay. But I can tell you that most states that have licensure require licensure for, for auctioneers, follow laws that are pretty close to what we do here in Illinois, which is a little on the strict side. So it's possible that whatever state this auction was in, it's a little bit different, but I happen to have looked at their laws and they're pretty similar. So I have never heard of multipliers, but you may meet another auctioneer who said, oh yeah, sure, we use them all the time. I do camera auctions. I don't auction storage lockers or, or livestock or anything else. So it, that may be a thing in other types of auctions, but I've certainly never heard of it in a camera auction. Moreover, it seems to me that it's very important and incumbent upon the auctioneer to advertise everything faithfully and, and accurately and clearly. And so my question, and so that being said, my question is, help me to understand this. There's an auction lot and they have, say, nine more 
and you can pick how many you want to buy? No. So picture, let's pretend it's eBay. You're scrolling through a list of auctions. Yeah. Every single lot has almost every one of them had multiple things in it. I don't. Right. There's like a bunch of different items that right. comprise one auction. Right. Lot. So right. you might see, you might see a box that has 10 folding Kodaks in it. They don't even waste their time. They're just trying to liquidate this crap. Yeah. 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 I, they don't even open them up. So you don't even know which totally. folding Kodak it is. So it'll say whatever your bid is. And then there's a times 10. So if you put in five bucks, you owe 50 if you win. In, in Paul's example, it was somebody we know who wanted one camera from a lot. So in his mind, he was like, what am I willing to pay for that one camera? I'll just buy the whole lot and All then right. everything else I don't need. What he did not realize was the price he put in his head that he bid for that one camera was multiplied by 10. I get that part. I get that part. So, all right. So there's, there's, a, there's a picture, there's an auction listing, a lot uh -huh. that has, say, seven or eight folding Kodaks, $10. Are you saying that there's four or five or seven or eight of these lots available or no, 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 no. it's one lot. And, but you're paying the, the, the prime example was, and, th and this is something that, that really uh, was the most egregious example. One lot had four items in it. There was a Nikkor W 35 millimeter 1.8 lens for the rangefinder camera. Yeah. Sure. Black you one. know, that's a, that's a valuable, that's a valuable Very lens, yeah. $800,000 yeah. lens. Yeah. There was also in that lot of uh, an L Nikkor enlarging lens. There were two L Nikkors, I thought. Two L Nikkors and something else that was really cheap, well, like a no value add-on yeah. fisheye lens or something yeah. like that. So the bidder bids eight hundred dollars. Well, because that was one that was priced per item, his eight hundred dollar bid was entered at thirty two hundred dollars. Yeah. Wait, because wait, hold on, because there's because that lot had three objects in it. Four, yeah, four objects four. total. I've never heard of that, and that does not. Now, again, I'm. I can. Uh, <laughs> I would be shocked. Let me just say it like this: I would be shocked to learn that that is ethical. It's not right. ethical. I don't think it's ethical. But I would be shocked to learn that it's legal. Shocked. Well, it's really, it wasn't spelled out. The terms and conditions are the things that prevail, and most people don't read them. And right. it is very possible that a clear explanation of this is part of their TNC. But uh, most of the states that govern auctioneering, they have a real problem with the idea of advertising something different than what you deliver. And almost any time anybody, do, any auctioneer does anything remotely, remotely funny um, or potentially malfeasance they're on them like white on rice i mean yeah. i'm telling you it, it and i can tell you that this uh, that the auction house has they have a license uh, everything else is on the up and up so i want can't help but wonder if there's something right. in that state's law or, and or in that auctioneer's terms and conditions that allow them to do that but it sounds awfully fishy to me and i think if the preponderance of your buyers are saying wait a minute something's not right then where there's smoke there's fire We've heard this from a couple other people. I remember even asking Paul at the beginning, because when we first, because Paul and I both went in a bunch of stuff. I threw out like 35 mercy bids. I had knew I wouldn't win <laughs> most of them. Paul threw out a bunch. At one point, Anthony was pondering, jumping in on this. Theo was like, I'm too far away. But I mean, at the very beginning, it wasn't clear. And, and it, it's like, to me, it would be one thing if every single thing they sold was this way. You would just go, that's just how these people do it. It's a little different, but I think if, if they were consistent, I, I would probably have like be a little bit better with it than I am, but like, you'd be just scrolling and this one would have a multiplier. This one wouldn't. And they would, and it would be like, picture a box of cameras here. And then you scroll to the next one, another box of cameras, but the first one uses a multiplier and the second one doesn't, there was like no rhyme or reason. Well, there were, there were, there was more hinky than that. I mean, like there was a, 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 a a lot of lenses where it was just like a box and all most of the lenses were either in a lens case or in boxes and they would not list like what all was in the lot they just said they're they're either lazy or they don't know what they have somebody spent a lot of money on one of these lots open them up and what were in the boxes were not what the boxes were for like it was supposed to be uh nikon rangefinder lenses and it was yeah. like auxiliary lenses for some 
you know, like a pocket camera. Instamatic. There was one that had an Instamatic yeah. in a box that was supposed to be a Nikon or something. Yeah. I'm really sorry to hear about that. It really stinks when this kind of thing happens. Yeah, I, it was, it, uh, I think it's a black eye on the whole auction. Well, world. it is. I think it is. And, and I'm particularly peeved about it, although it's not in my home state and it's really none of my darn business. But I'll tell you that there's nothing in the terms and conditions. I just read their terms and conditions. There's nothing in it about No, that. there isn't. I, I did There's the same thing. Nothing in it yeah. about that. There were there were a lot of people got had some problems with them, and, and it really yeah. it, it hurt them because uh, I I know a number of people that will not they won't simply they won't bid again on an auction. Right. So, That's the chance you take yeah. as an auctioneer. That's why you have to be absolutely honest and absolutely forthright, and you have to follow the letter of the law. There cannot be even the whiff of misappropriation, yeah. and that's why an auction is such a valuable and in fun and wonderful thing to do because when it's honest and forthright and it is exciting and you can yeah. get things that you never saw before and it can be a wonderful way to buy and sell however there's a lot of people out there who take advantage of the system because let's face it a lot of our governments have too many other fish to fry besides looking into sure. the dealings of a you know small company so there's more to the story though too so paul so they offered shipping which most do but you're going to get raked over the coals when you do shipping especially with multiple lots because a lot of times they're going to charge you a fee per lot or they're going to charge you handling or whatever so uh knowing that it was you know in in paul's state uh myself and a few other you know friends of the show had paul use his locality to pick up this stuff so Describe, Paul, what it was like when you went there to get your stuff. It was in a, It was about a three and a half hour drive each way for me. It was uh, about six miles from East Palestine, Ohio, which is where the train derailment was. Oh, jeez. Uh, south of Youngstown, and it was it was in an old shed that had been a a semi truck repair facility, and it was absolutely filthy inside, full of dust, and and uh, was really nasty. Well, I, I they had my stuff already. And so I went through over my stuff and they had two boxes that were, had the wrong items. I mean, it was simply wasn't the stuff I bought. So it took a while. They got that straightened out. I picked up the other stuff from Mike and, and something for two other guys. This was really the worst story. One of the boxes I picked up was one lot, a box that had maybe 20 lenses in it. When I got to the place where I was meeting the guy to give him his box, he looks at it. And the one item that he bid on was not in the box. It was in a particular area in the box. He knew where it should have been, and it simply wasn't there. And it was the only item in that box that had any value. He took care of it with the uh, auction company, and, and they did resolve it to his uh, satisfaction. You know, it's it's awfully easy to, because since we don't know how hard this is for somebody to do, but it was very poorly managed. It was yeah, I'm sorry to hear that. That you know, it, it is to go back to the like where where the conversation began in the and like what it takes to put on an auction. It's a lot. Well, I, I wanted to ask you how how much time are you personally spending like the year scouting things, or do people approach you and say, "I want you to auction my item for me"? A little bit of both. So I I spend a fair amount of time scouting and calling for consignments and picking up consignments and trying to convince people that uh, our auction house is the best place to sell their rare Leica or, or whatever. And we also get people that know the name or want their camera to go to an auction that's not a just basic, you know, uh, storage locker kind of auction. They want it to go to a fancy camera auction. And so we do spend a fair amount of time both seeking out and fielding calls for consignments. And basically my, because we have an annual auction that occurs in November, with usually more than 200 lots. Typically it's two to 300, sometimes more. Each lot has to be handled, tested, inspected, described, fact-checked, photographed, listed, proofread, double-checked, triple-checked, and then we take the catalog to print. Every year there's typos. Every year the toilets explode. It's just the way it goes. I was going to say, and, and you have time to run a retail shop on top of that. 
Yeah, well, it's not just me. I've got help. <laughs> but basically, my uh, to do the auction in November with say 250 lots, typically I begin the process in the beginning of July, right after the 4th of July holiday. We close consignments unless somebody has like a number 102. We close consignments at the end of August to deliver to the printer right after Labor Day to have catalogs in hand October 15th or thereabouts a month ahead of the billing. Uh, pardon me, a month ahead of the online. Uh, uh, so the online has one month uh, before the auction. Your auctions, you and it's really cool that you do this, that you uh, your past auctions are still online. We have a number of those, uh, number of that stuff online on our website. Not all of them, but. No, but we, we you have a, one of your uh, regular buyers is a good friend of ours that we will refer to him as Vaughn Cabbage. And uh, you, you, you would know who... <laughs> Mr. X. Yeah, Mr. X, Mr. Vaughn Cabbage. Well, uh, Vaughn Cabbage and I were yakking one evening about uh, about something that he bought from you at one of the Uh-oh. auctions. And, Uh-oh. and he, I said, well, he, he couldn't remember what he paid for it. And I said, well, let's go look. So I found the auction, found the listing. Told him what he paid for it, and he, then he he shut up. <laughs> he thought he thought he had paid about three times what he actually paid for it. So we all feel that way. Oh yeah, don't we? Oh, yeah. <laughs> especially especially Juan Cabbage. Was it the three D? It might have been. I'm going to tell you a story about this guy. I love this guy. I so we made this trade. I think it was actually this trade. I don't think he would mind my telling you this. I hope not. We made this trade and he had a balance and there wasn't a lot but he had a balance and we worked out this great trade we were both very pleased with it i hope that he's still pleased we worked out this great trade but he owed me i don't remember 800 bucks or something i wasn't a tremendous amount of money but it was real money and i get this package from his neck of the woods right and i don't remember seeing his name but i remember i was like oh i know where that is and I open it up and it's this old camera. I mean, really old camera, like a little box camera with a little brass lens with no optics or anything in it, right? Just like a little box. Like you would look at this camera and be like, oh, and you just throw it, you throw it away. I mean, it's not even, there's no name on it, there's no nothing. And so I put it on my desk and a couple of days, three, four days went by and he calls, he goes, hey, did you get my package? And I was like, what are, we, what are you talking about? And he says, I sent you a camera, an old camera, a really old camera. And I was like, oh, you got to be kidding me. So I said, yeah, you know, I'm, I didn't know where, I didn't, I did, you didn't put a note. I didn't even know anything about it. He goes, open it up. And I had to take a minute or two to figure out how to open this Fakakta thing up. And finally I opened it up and boing, out sprang a whole bunch of cash. <laughs> that's that's got to be the same guy. That has yeah, it absolutely been. is. I yeah. hope he's yeah, as yeah. pleased with that trade as I am. Yeah, because it's, a, and it's a great story too. Well, one of the things, he and I were trading some things. Oh, yeah. And uh, one of the things I got from him was an Oleo. Which yeah, is, Paul's got a, like a single shot. Yeah. Single shot that, uh, which is an unusual thing because it's a little, it's a, cam- a Leica camera that takes a film holder and it makes yeah. simple exposure. And you've got the viewfinder too. Uh, the Suwu. Oof, boy. This those is things. the thing. The, the, an, an Oleo, which is what this whole thing is called mm-hmm. with the shutter. You know, they're, they're a certain amount of money. When you put the little finder on the top, you triple the value. Yeah, or triples, right. That little thing, you could you lose that little viewfinder. Like, you could lose it, I mean, in your lap. It's it's tiny. It was the finder that came on the Leica 1. So it's it's basically the mm-hmm. a very hard thing to find. For some reason, this did not fit in his collection. So He's got some really interesting, like, prerequisites for stuff. I mean... I've shared this story before. I I was at his house, you know, visiting stuff. And it's it's hard to describe because like most people have like a camera room or they're all in the basement or or somewhere, right? In this this guy's house, like you'll go into like one living room and there'll be like three tiny cabinets and you'll spend a little bit of time looking here and you'll look at here and then you're like, all right, one more cabinet to go. And then you'll look here and, and then you're like, oh, this is a nice collection. And it'll go, all right, let's go to the other room. Let's go to the camera room. Another right. room. No, like there is no camera room because everyone in the house is the camera room. Like there would be like hutches in a hallway that's filled with cameras and his wow. his bedroom like next to his bed is his alpa cabinet 
And I just remember like going from room to room and like, I've, I mean, I, I, this sounds like first world problems, but anybody who loves cameras, you would think if, Hey, wouldn't it be awesome to go to this house where it's like wall to wall cameras and stuff. (laughs) And that's, that sounds good on paper, but you get so emotionally drained constantly looking and, and we're talking like rare, rare stuff too. You know, like he's got a terrific collection. There are so many incredibly rare cameras that I'll probably never, ever see in my life that were right in front of me. And I didn't even touch it because there was something rare right next to it. Theo, is it weird that they're talking about you? And you're just sitting here having to take this? <laughs> <laughs> uh, not quite. <laughs> he has a terrific collection and it's Absolutely. eclectic too. I must confess, yeah. I, I don't, I have no idea. I would never cold call him, Right. I have no idea what he's looking for. Yeah. Absolutely none. No, because like, I'd love to do more business. No, we've got some rare stuff, you know, but I just don't have a handle on what that particular collector is looking for. And that's another, that's actually another aspect of auctioneering that's, that's kind of interesting is that we have clientele who are looking for things and we have clientele who are divesting from their collection. Right. Having either a change of heart about this camera or wanting to, you know, fund their kids college or they want a Ferrari or who knows what, you know, who knows what it is. So it's, there's a lot of different things in, in play. That's for sure. Not to be morbid at all, but obviously we only are on this, this planet for a length of time. And uh, whenever this day comes where that collection needs a new home, it's going to be like in star Wars where there's like a ripple in the force, you know, collectors (laughs) all over the world are going to be like, uh Oh, because I would assume it would go to an auction house or somebody, but I I don't even know how to describe like what's going to happen to all this stuff. Because it's just, <laughs> just, uh, just take my word for it. Take whatever level of exaggeration you think I'm giving on this thing. It's actually more than that. Well, let, let me come back to a, a question about auctions, since this is something that probably Paul and, and Dan can speak to. I mean, obviously, Dan, you've got your Leica auction and, and you know, I get that catalog every summer and just sort of like, thumb through it and thinking maybe I can get this lot, you know, cause it'd be something, it's like the wish book from Sears back when I was right. 10 years old. But I know that there are a number of, of like standing European auctions that are quite famous. Yeah. So what are the other high profile collectors auctions that, uh, that, that, that should be worth checking out? I mean, I mean, obviously we're not, I'm not going to be you know spending, you know, 50 grand on, you know, some rare Alpa, uh, but but what are the other auctions to keep an eye out for? Well, I think that as it as it pertains to cameras, the most exciting auction house in the world is Lars Natapil, uh, Lars Natapil's auction house, Vetslar Camera Auction, and they're based in Vetslar at Dom Platz, and he's got a terrific little shop right around the corner there uh, uh, for you know regular Leica. Uh, but that he Lars Natapil's auction house is absolutely top notch. Is it a once a year auction or does he have rolling auctions throughout the year? He does once a year, once a year. And the consignments that he gets or the items that he has in his sale are in the world of Leica, some of the most spectacular stuff that ever comes to auction. And and it's aces, absolutely aces. There's another, um, there's a few other auction houses. There's one in Sweden. There's one in uh, a couple in Hong Kong. Um, there's a few in the UK, um, uh, Flint's and Cheswick that sometimes do cameras. And of course, Leica has their own auction house, which used to be the Vienna Leica shop, used to be Peter Cohn's auction house and is now uh, Leica auction. And Westlicht? Westlicht, exactly, exactly, the essentials. Here in the United States, it's a little bit different in that there are estates that come up like this one that we were talking about earlier. And you don't necessarily know exactly what it is that you're selling. It's just personal property. And so I've bought stuff from auctions and because they didn't really know exactly what they had and the price was right and you buy it. Uh, not every auctioneer who's handling Leica knows Leica. Not every auctioneer that's handling a Fabergé egg knows about Fabergé eggs. I mean, sometimes it's a storage locker with a whole bunch of stuff, or it's an estate with, you know, 4,000 objects, and you can't possibly properly describe every single one because the estate, and keep this in mind, that there are o- almost always other factors involved. 
maybe the estate needs to close within the year. And the auction house is like, we just got to sell this stuff. It doesn't matter. So you kind of, you never know. It depends on whether it's a personal property, basic storage locker, or just a basic auction, or whether it's specialized. And our auction house is specialized. So is that why uh, I I subscribe to, um, I think it's called the sale room in the, I think it's based out of the UK, where they, they basically hoover up all the different auctions around the place and, and, and give you listings based on your search criteria. Interesting enough, there's a lot of auctions that pop up where they sell like a, a trio of cannons or, you know, or a tub of cameras. And that's the right. description. And that's right. it. And is that the situation where that auctioneer doesn't quite know what to do with this stuff? Yes, yeah. I think I would think so. I mean, it, it is very possible that that tub of cameras, somebody went through it and realized that it's a bunch of coal and there's no diamonds, but it's also possible, equally possible that inside that tub of coal is one single diamond. I mean, it happens. And that's the thrill of the chase, you know, that's I right. mean, I'll admit the auction we were talking about earlier, it was pretty clear to me that these people were not camera people, right? You know, they, right. Uh, you know, Anthony picked up on what was it? Uh, uh Walter Teague, yeah, there, there's Brownie. a Walter Darwin Teague. No, it was the Kodak Gift Camera 1A, which is like the the classic Art Deco, right? Darwin Teague in the, design in the box, too, right? Yeah, yeah. And it was in a lot of three, it was one of these lots with the multiplier, and the uh, two other cameras that were with it were just crumbly, nasty old Kodak folders. It just said Kodak folders. So yeah, anybody... it, just said, it said colorful Kodak folders. Right. And, it, you know, here was a $700 Darwin T gift camera with two other junkers. And just right. because they were colorful, that was the lot description. Yeah. And, and I don't fault them for that. I don't fault them for not knowing the cameras. I don't even fault them for how right. they were listed. You know, the multiplier, things missing from boxes, and then them giving this illusion of a professional auction house and then having you go to a mechanics garage <laughs> to pick up, you know, your, you know, what, for what some of these people were paying was quite, you know, quite a bit of money, you know, I think is what mm -hmm. bugs me, but like, like, I love the thrill of the chase. There is nothing more exciting than getting that box of junk and digging through it and be like, Oh, that's how you found that contacts adapter, Paul, wasn't it? Wasn't it at the very bottom of a box? Yeah, I found an Orion adapter. Yeah. So bag. I was telling the guys there was, there was a, a lot that ended recently I'll have to share this in the group because it is the worst pictures anybody has ever taken of a camera. I mean, it, it was like super close up, blurry. You couldn't make out even like barely a part of the camera. You had no idea what it was. And this person said Olympus, Zuiko. I could tell it was a folder. So I'm thinking Olympus didn't make too many folding cameras. So it's probably an Olympus 6. And it kind of, from the blurry pictures... Um, you could kind of tell that's probably an Olympus six, but the, the reason I was interested in it is it said 2.8. The guy didn't even know what that meant. He just put the number 2.8 in there. And I know that the Zuiko's with the 2.8 lenses were kind of like the higher end Olympus sixes. So I'm like, you know what? I'm feeling lucky today. I'm going to you know throw out a $15 bid, which I won. You know, I think I paid 15 in shipping too. So I got this thing for 30 bucks, not knowing what the hell I'm going to get. I, you know, who knows what it could be. The picture was so bad. You couldn't even see it. And, you know, I got exactly what I thought I was getting, you know, it was an Olympic. It's kind of hard to see here, but this thing cleaned up really nice. The glass is excellent. Shutter works at all speeds. Really the only fault fault in it is the original battery covering has gotten brittle and it's falling off, but this has the five element 2.8 Olympus Wico. It's got a copal shutter. Uh, I mean, it's heavy, you know, this is, Basically, like a Mamiya 6, the only difference is the Mamiya 6 has that moving film plane. This doesn't have that. But dual format, all metal, the bellows are light tight, and it worked out okay. You know, wow. but I also I also knew if I got a pile of shit, I wouldn't have been that mad because you know I, I didn't put much into it. But that thrill you can get out of not knowing what you're gonna have, you have to at least believe that the person running it wasn't maliciously doing something. Well, Mike, I go back to the auction from, from Georgia that was last year. Right. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I, I know that you felt like you kind of got burned on a few of those lots. I got lucky and that there was a lot where, again, they obviously did not know what they had. And it was yeah. just said pair of Zeiss folding cameras. 
and the photos were blurry. You really could not tell what the cameras were, right. but I know enough that I'm like, oh, that's a Super Iconta 530, and that's a 532.16. Yeah. And so I took a chance on it, and nobody else bid on them. And I got that lot for, I mean, I think I ended up spending $25 per camera, you know? And like I sent the, the one was like a, a late 1950, 859, uh, the 532, 16, uh, sent it up to, to Jurgen to be CLA'd, and the camera's like brand new. And uh, then the other one was a 530, the, the original 645, that was the sort of the first version of the Super Iconta. And yeah, I mean, it's it's from like 1927. So, yep, uh, we've got one over here with... Uh, yeah. Uh, mine, mine's older than that. It's It's got, it's a slightly different design. It's a little bit more compact. It was the first Super Iconta. And, you know, it shows the wear, it shows the patina of being a 1920s camera, but it also works like clockwork. And so I ended up with, with two Super Icontas for 50 bucks. Well, in the case of that auction, any feeling of being burnt was entirely my fault. I overbid on things and I did not read or fully understand how they ship stuff, which they did have in their terms of conditions. Uh, I just didn't do my homework on it. So on that one, it's me. But it's a good cautionary tale in addition to the other auction we were talking about earlier to make sure you know what you're getting yourself into. It's 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 actually where, where you have to be quite logical with this as well because if I refer back to the New Zealand auction where Anthony's ghost superb <laughs> it originated from, it was actually what, what I considered at that point was – that these people didn't quite know what they had. They were auctioning at a really weird time for the rest of the world, great for Australia and New Zealand, but terrible for the US and terrible for Europe. I just assumed that every single camera I bid on, and I think I got like a, a, about 10 or 12 cameras out of that auction, was going to actually require a a service. Right, right. And so I ended up at bargain prices for you know, two Superbs, a couple of Super, super Condors, so, so, and there was, uh, you know, lauder mats and all sorts of things like that. So when, when they arrived, 50% of them, to be true, need a service. But I'd actually budgeted for all of them to be. So, so I came out quite ahead and, uh, uh, in that respect. So it, it's a matter of picking on where you're buying. And if they know, like if I was bidding on one of Dan's uh, auctions, I'd assume everything was working perfectly. And, you know, and otherwise you tell me. And um, wouldn't have to factor in the, the the service afterwards. So that's sort of the key on that. What I see on auctions when they're being honest, you know. So the New Zealand auction was being honest. They put up these cameras. They 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 kind of said, "Don't know if it works properly. It's up to you." And but they at least listed what it was. The one that I um, that was talked about earlier, I had a bit of a look through that, and I thought, well, it was such a risk based on those descriptions. When I then include a shipping to Australia, there was no way I was even going to touch that auction. Even if you weren't worried about shipping all the way to Australia, I think that it was it was tight. I mean, it, that was tight. I mean, for somebody like me, I wouldn't have bought from that auction only because I have a tremendous inventory already that I um, I want to sell. <laughs> yeah. So, but I can understand why there's a lot in there that's very tempting. But I think it makes a lot of sense to, you know, read carefully and make sure that the cameras do, right. you know, that they need they need service. I want to just step back to in in regards to the Ohio auction. I, I don't think any of us are willing to go to the extreme of saying these people intentionally tried to screw people. I don't think that's the case. Oh. No. I really do think they were in over their heads. This was a less professionally run outfit. I had a question. They responded to it. Our mutual friend had the missing lens. Even though that sucked, they made it right. You know, Paul, yeah. you said you got there. Some of the stuff wasn't what you got, but they figured it out. So I, I will I will say I don't think they were purposely trying to screw anybody. This wasn't some like shady back alley, you know, <laughs> we're gonna screw these geeks, you know. I agree with you, Mike. But yeah. there were there were some red flags that I think if if there's a lesson here uh, of, of everything we're talking about, clearly you go to Westlick. You go to Tamarkin Auctions, you go to Christie's, you're going to pay through the nose, but it, you're, you're paying for the premium. You're paying for quality. You're paying for perfection, a catalog. There's a lot of time and effort that goes through that because you're getting a quality product. 
when you're going for estate sales for less.com and they say they have a camera collection up there, <laughs> you got to put on your BS hat or, or, you know, you got to put the, you know, like, like Theo and Anthony both said, they looked at it and like, Oh man, you know, I mean, I picked up on the multiplier. It was very shoddily listed. It wasn't in their terms and services. I can totally see how some people who maybe didn't spend the time to read everything and look and pay really close attention. It was very easy to miss. I just think that they have very peculiar listing practices. But if, if you're going to buy something, the same rules apply to eBay as it does an auction or a gr garage sale. You know, use common sense. If if you can see that this stuff is just crap thrown in a box, you know, for, to the guy who thought because he saw a Nikon rangefinder box, there should be a Nikon rangefinder lens in it. I don't know if I agree with that. You know, the way it was listed, it made it sound like it could be. But like, I personally would never throw a ton of money. I, I shared a story a couple episodes back how I went to an estate sale based off of seeing a box. The difference was I could have just left. You know, I wasn't committing hundreds and hundreds of dollars to buying this, what could be an empty box. But, you know, some people kind of, you know, maybe they're not as experienced with this kind of stuff or whatever, and or, or they're just optimistic and hoping for the best. You just, you can't hope for the best when you do these things. You have to do like Theo did and factor in repairing. That's right. My spider senses were tingling pretty hard when I looked at it. You know, there were just too many <laughs> things that, and, and again, for me, it's like, like I'm looking at this thinking, now, what does this auction house normally do? Is it, is it real estate or doing farm implements? I Good mean, question. How, yeah. Good how question. is it that they're they're handling these cameras? Because there was your, there was just too many things that could easily have made it a pretty seamless auction that they just didn't do. You, you we were talking earlier about where does stuff come from? Where do, where does Dan get his stuff? Where do I get my stuff? The thing that that, that makes it happen is that you have history. Stuff begets stuff. So. Dan's father right. had uh, started the the thing and and had such a great reputation that you have a known name and people call you. That's so right. So that's where it all comes from, and it's all based on it's all reputation based. So it it comes from buying and selling. You have to have the reputation, a good reputation in both ends of it. In my case, it's a little different because I'm in such a small area. I had very loyal customers. So the people that I dealt with over the 33 years come back to me and say, okay, I need to do this or I want to do that. And um, right. it, that's the way it happens. I mean, it just, it feeds on itself. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that we, we, that we always do is we write a handwritten note. Somebody buys a camera from us. We, at the very least, we write, you know, thank you and sign our name and people will keep that receipt with the camera and yeah. then when their heirs or whomever doesn't know what to do with it, they give us a call. That's how Paul's gotten a lot. You get About people. 19, 1985, the uh, president of the Leica Historical Society of America lived in the area. And he was a customer of mine. He bought a lot of stuff from me. Well, he passed away. Jim Logger bought his collection, except for a couple pieces. Then, And the guy only had, he had one daughter. And that was all. That was the last of the family. She had called me to see if I wanted to buy a few pieces that were left over. And I said, uh, yes, I'd love to. Well, we made appointments three different times and she backed out on getting together three times. And it was, I found out later she had some, some emotional issues that were really not, it wasn't her fault. She just, she just had some problems. And then she passed away and I saw her obituary in the newspaper and I knew that she had these cameras, so I contacted her rabbi and uh, said, I, I just have to say, I know she she has no family, there's nobody, there are no heirs, but there are going to be some cameras in her house that should not go to goodwill. They they should be, you know, they should be sold because they have great monetary value. About two weeks later, I hear from the, uh, the attorney who's handling the estate and says, do you want to come look at these cameras? So... <laughs> I went to look at them, and the first thing I see when I get there is an LHSA kit, the 25th anniversary kit with three lenses in the original wooden case. It was just, there was like four or five things that Logger had not bought that showed up uh, in in the estate. And they had just he been- He probably didn't know that they were available at the time. He would have bought them. Yeah, he did. It was it was, it was was at the end of, of his life, and, uh, and he just he decided he wouldn't sell that. He'd hang on to that. 
Oh, I see. Yes. So, I mean, it's just, it's just one of those things that uh, if you do things right and you, you stay after it, it comes back to you. That's right. I want to share kind of a, a positive story. There's another like big lot of camera story that's been making the rounds of all the Facebook groups. Uh, it, it made it on the Steve Dowling posted on his site. It's been on Petapixel, but this, this lady, Kristen Kusumano, her and her boyfriend, uh, it was like her boss had a storage locker full of cameras. We've probably yep. all heard the story. A uh, lot of Minolta, a lot of Miranda. So I've actually been in contact with the girl. Super, super nice. I've heard a couple of people who've bought stuff from her. You know, she, to her right, is trying to get kind of premium prices for some of the more rare stuff. But she does have a lot of like low value stuff that, you know, we're all, you know, we're all wondering what to do with. But she had um, an Olympus FTL. Um, I had one. I wanted to get a second one that I just saw there. And um, I've always wanted an, um, a Minolta SR2. And she had a bunch of those too. And uh, her and I talked about it. And she just shipped it to me super fast. I gave her an A++ for like one of the best wrapped packages. Like stuff was like shrink wrapped and bubble wrapped and then taped and then like padding and then the box was like covered in plastic and then taped on top of that i mean this thing could have went into a canal and it probably would have been fine so um you know there, there's some really good people out there you know there's some good option or um options for buying stuff uh, i wish her the best of luck and everything else she's trying to sell you know I, I a lot of it is like like you like anthony and theo man if your spidey senses are tingling there's probably a reason for it i mean everybody wants to find the the lake like a number 102 in their aunt's closet but i mean the reality <laughs> is it's, it's just not going to happen yeah look I, I i can share another good story even with one of our hosts here paul i bought i recently bought some cameras off paul unlike the shipment i sent to anthony he shipped it i bought it on the monday he shipped it I, it arrived on the friday um so that's from ohio through to to sydney everything you know i obviously know paul so um really trusting what he sent sends me and yeah I, I couldn't be happier with the with the cameras that arrived i mean they were, they were superb you know this little contessa 35 um exactly as it was described just what i've been looking for so it's yeah it's it's a matter of understanding who you're buying from and their reputation which yeah. uh which makes a huge difference so so you got that fancy shirt theo um d didn't you get any new shirts recently i don't see you wearing it <laughs> hang on a second so we had some camerosity podcast t-shirts made up once and i made them i made them for the guys oh i love it we, we did this last summer but i i, <laughs> I haven't worn it yet <laughs> turn, it, turn I, it around theo yeah turn it around i put a qr, There's a code, QR on code on the back of it what a great idea. I wore mine to the camera show and people were taking taking pictures of the QR code and getting to Mike Ekman's website. What a great idea. Dan, I had that shirt on when I came to visit you last summer. I don't know if you remember, but I was you wearing did. that exact shirt. Yeah. That's right. I remember yeah. now. <laughs> it's Maybe taken, we'll have to make more. It's taken what how much? Eight months for it to get to me, but uh, it finally got to me. So I need to order something from Paul. <laughs> I had him made up around a period of time where Theo was making almost monthly purchases from Paul. And I was like, oh, I'll just send it to Paul. And then the next time Theo buys something, he can just use it as padding or something in the box. And <laughs> that, that begat a dry spell from Theo wanting to buy something. So it uh, it kind of waited there until he had his next purchase, which was just recently. So uh, what else did you get from Paul, Theo? Isn't there anything else there besides yeah, the Contessa? There's a couple of things. There's um, this beautiful little Ansco memo. The memo, very nice. Half frame um, from the 1920s. This is in great shape, actually. This is in really I nice shape. I love that this camera. Is, this is, um, and Paul did actually warn me that the lens had a bit of haze on it. And interesting enough, it just comes off. You wipe it and it's nice and clean. So um, I really appreciate this one, Paul, because this is a really nice little camera. There's a very loose, uh, very loose, like a connection with that camera where I'll say that, you know, like is famous for if you had an earlier model and you wanted to add, like, let's say flash synchronization or something to it, you could send it back to the factory and they would upgrade it for you. You know, there were certain upgrades like you could get non range finder like a ones and have a range finder added to it if you wanted to. Well, Ansco had a similar program with that camera, too, where I, you probably have the basic wall and sack lens on there, but they actually did offer that, I think, with a Zeiss lens. And if you 
bought the base model and wanted to later upgrade it, you could send it back to ANSCO and you would just pay the difference between what the better lens would have called. And they would actually upgrade the camera for you to, to add a better shutter and lens if you wanted to. Okay. So, this is, this has got the Cinemat lens. Cinemat. Okay. Ilex ANSCO shutter. I mean, it's obviously not a Zeiss, but I know that they had a couple different lens options for that. They also had, you could use it as a projector too. There was actually like an, a projector really? attachment too that you could add to it too. So like I said, it's not really like a, but like I said, it's it's similar in that they offered an upgrade path to people who use that camera. Um, and it's got a, a nice big bright viewfinder. It's scale focused, but it's vertical. You know, you just kind of move that ratcheting thing on the back. Really, really neat camera. I'm excited to hear. Uh, yeah, there you go. I'm excited to hear what you think of it when you get a chance to shoot at no, I'm looking forward to it. It, it does only have one cartridge, but the car, you can build the cartridge very easily. So I'm just going to make one up myself because it did actually use the wooden cartridges. And the other camera that was actually in the lot, and you know, I, I'm joking with um, Paul because he ripped me off with this. I've got a Canon A1, but it doesn't have the squeak. I got ripped off. You wanted no a squeak. squeak yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm really happy with this one. Again, in, in really nice condition. So I really am um, quite happy with the purchase from Paul. And uh, I'm sure I'll be doing more business with him sooner or later too. Yeah. What else do you have loaded right now, Theo? I'm working through a bit of photography with my um, Super Conta. Yeah. Yeah. This is the, the 6x9 uh, version. Um, I can never remember the model numbers on these. I think. Oh, here it is. 530 slash do. So... Um, this is one that got serviced by Jess, uh, who went all out and repainted bits on it and all sorts of stuff. And I've, I've scratched them again, but that's another matter. <laughs> um, but uh, that uh, this thing is like brand new now. It is absolutely really fantastic. Nice. I'm really cool. enjoying that. I'm shooting with a superb. I bought a few cameras here and there. Yeah, even even a little um, auto half, a Rico auto half came. Okay fun little camera just purely because it's it's got the i think they came in like a hundred different colors combinations the japanese market had yours is red they had a mm. whole bunch of funky body patterns there was blue i think green i have that same camera but mine's just black so you have one okay. of the colored ones which is really cool yeah and um, i've been shooting a fair bit with my rolly 35 lately as well once i um i I've, actually interesting story here i uh, I have a bit of a problem where I've had two rolls of film with the uh, Rolly 35 that just didn't wind on and I didn't notice and I went through the whole rolls and, and thought, um, there's something wrong with the camera. When Paul sent me uh, my light cameras, uh, he had a roll of film in the back of the Contessa, which he promptly said, do not develop that film, it's only a test film, uh, which obviously got us a bit interested in what the doesn't Paul want us to actually develop? But anyway, I trusted him. <laughs> and I used that, that roll of film to test out the Rolly 35. As it turns out, I was actually putting the film behind the actual, the, the, the mechanism. The pressure plate? Fla the pressure plate, thank you. There you go. And I was consistently doing. So the problem with that camera is actually the stupid user syndrome. <laughs> and yeah. it, it basically, um, and since then I've, I've actually been using it. It's a great little camera. I love using it. Um, it's, uh, what's, how, how does your scale go, Paul? It's what, per dent? One to eight. One to eight. One to eight. One to eight. Okay. This one here. Yep. Uh, it's, it's a one. There's a little dent on the top here. There's a bit of brassing on the side, but that's about it. Okay, so the, there are no dents on the corners. Right, and we're getting no. the corners. That's unbelievable. The dents yeah. in the top are usually a result of the um, the lever. I think it gets bumped or something. You could dent them on the top too. Yeah. By that point so, in their career, they were they the, the gauge of the metal was getting thinner and thinner and thinner. You know, they weren't using thick brass like the old Leicas did. They were getting they were getting skimpy on it. So well, this, just, this is this is an early model. It is a Singaporean yeah. one. But it is an earlier one, and it, it does have the brass in here. You can see it's got a fairly solid construction yeah. to it. So I'm, I'm, I'm really happy with it. The, inch, um, the, the one hard thing I find with the Rolly 35s, and I don't know, Anthony, you've been using them a fair bit too, is does your finger automatically go over the meter? Absolutely. No, it goes over the collapsible. But Oh, that too, yes. No, my yes. problem with it is that I always think that I'm hitting the shutter release and I'm hitting the button that for ex yeah. extracting the lens. Yeah. 
I've done that. But they're beautiful little cameras. And, uh, you know, once you get used to the scale focusing, it's uh, it's perfect. Uh, so so that's mainly what I've been shooting with lately. And uh, the Mamiya 7. So I've been throwing you know, a fair bit of film through that because I kind of figured that that's you know, like that was my holy grail camera and I got it and I haven't used it enough. So um, the last few months, there's, there's been a fair bit of film going through that camera just to, to make sure I enjoy it. The one other one that I've been using too is actually a Nikon F FE. I took it on holidays with me. What a great little camera. I never realized it uh, because I love the FM2N. And uh, I think, it, is it Anthony? You, you enjoy that as well, don't you? Um, with the I've got the FM2. Yeah, FM2. It's it's almost like an electronic version of the FM2. And it's really, really nice to use. So I'm, I'm actually quite pleased with that one as well. Yeah, the FE is the electronic version of the FM. E is electronic, M is manual. They came out with both those cameras in 77 when Nikon released the new auto indexing lenses. They replaced them, I think, in 83 with the FE2 and FM2. Those cameras increased the top shutter speed, but lost the ability of using the non-AI lenses. So for people who want something more modern, the FE2 and FM2 are, are better bets, especially if you're not going to use the older lenses. Then later on, they made the FM3 that everybody loves. They never did make an FE3, though. But um, Anthony, what about you? What have you been shooting besides the Fuji 617? Yeah, I um, picked up uh, through our friend Paul, who is like the you know neighborhood crack dealer, picked up a, a Minox LX, which was the last sort of automated version of the, the, the real professional grade Minox cameras. And I'm running a roll of Ektar through it right now. And I really do enjoy that camera. The other thing I've been shooting, well, I've got the uh, I've got my my Acarel loaded up with some tech pan and uh, the um, uh, Nikon F with the uh, low profile viewfinder with the 105 2.5 lens. Uh, and I was doing some concert photography using some of the Eastman Vision 3 uh, 500T uh, and then developing it in ECN2 uh, chemicals and got some really lovely photographs from a uh, series of concerts in Jacksonville last weekend. I just forget how much I just like that Nikon F, you know, it's not the first camera I pick up. Uh, but when I have it, I'm just, especially with that 105 2.5, I think that's just such a super combination. I love that lens. Absolutely. It's beautiful lens. Yeah. Yeah. And then the other thing is I finally got my, uh, Olympus pin F back from Mike Novak. Uh, so I've got that loaded up as well. Oh, cool. Yeah. Uh, real quick, very short story. I had an Olympus Pen F body that the shutter was jammed on it. I was asking Paul about it a couple of weeks ago and he was trying to give me some tips on how to unlock it and couldn't get it done. So I just threw it on eBay for, you know, kind of a low bid and, and a guy, you know, threw me an offer. I accepted it. Um, you know, he emailed, you know, you're dealing with the person through eBay. You just get to hear their username. And, uh, I asked him like, well, is there anything else like you you're looking for? He goes, you know, I have a bunch of broken cameras and he goes, now nah, I mainly shoot gray flex. And I'm like, oh, if you like gray flex, uh, I'm on a podcast. You should Google, you know, cause eBay is funny about links. Um, you should Google camerosity podcast. We just did a show on that. He goes, yeah, I was there. <laughs> and I, I did not realize I was talking to Dan uh, Belmes. Um, he was one of the, the guests on the show. So completely rando, you know, I ended up selling him the Olympus Pan F body with the inoperable shutter. Um, I, he probably hasn't even received it yet, but it was just, I happened to mention the show and it was someone who not only listens to the show, but was on it. So I thought that was kind of funny. In regards to shooting, uh, Theo, you're shooting a Rico. I'm shooting a very different Rico. Um, this is the Sears Roebuck TLS, which is a rebranded Rico. Um, this one has one of my favorite logos of any camera on it. Um, if you look, it looks kind of like an atomic, like an atom. Yeah, that's but a great you, logo. But if you actually look at it, it's actually SR. SP or SR. SR yeah. for yeah. Sears Roebuck. So they kind of did this sort of atomic logo, which was popular in the 60s, but they actually stylized it like Sears Roebuck. And it's kind of a rudimentary camera, but it's got a Rikinon 1.4, so a huge monster lens on it. Um, I'm shooting a Practica VLC3. Um, if, if you want to try a Practica, these are really, really nice. The lenses on them are excellent. It's got a interchangeable prism, uh, more Olympus love. I got the Olympus six, but I'm shooting a 35 SP. This is a really, really nice range finder, seven element, um, fixed lens. 
the claim to fame for the SP is that it has a um, spot meter on it, a dual averaging. It by default is averaging reading, or if you press the button, it'll actually take a spot meter. And the way the manual works, because you know, you think, how do you do a spot meter on a rangefinder? It actually takes a reading from where the rangefinder patch is. So while you're composing the little rectangular rangefinder patch in the middle, that's where it's taking the reading from. So you can kind of get an idea of like what part of your image you're trying to get the metering range from. And then the last camera, I don't have it in front of me. I'm, I'm shooting a Toko Tone, T-O-N-E, which is one of those really tiny Japanese like hit style cameras, like the micro uh, they made like thousands of different ones of them. But um, the, this one, the reason I chose this one is it actually has a three speed shutter. You can choose three different speeds. It's got an adjustable diaphragm and a full focusing lens. So um, it's a slightly upscale version of those Japanese hit cameras. So I'm eager to see what kind of results I get from uh, the hand cut 17 and a half millimeter film that those use. Paul, did you have anything else you wanted to throw out before we go? No, the only thing I'm shooting with is, uh, in, in Dan's honor, I'm going ah. to shoot with this lens on uh, Anthony's M3 uh, because I don't. I, the, I have a 50 uh, millimeter black Wetzlar that I usually use on the M6, but I've got this Sumalux that uh, this camera body yeah. is. The, this is the Barnack M42 Gold camera, and it has a 51.4 Sumalux on it. The body has never had a roll of film in it, but I've used the lens a lot. Yeah, it's a great lens on various other cameras. Uh, so I'm going to shoot. Uh, I'm going to test Anthony's M3 out with that lens. Do you have to um, dress like a prince from the Middle East to actually use that camera? No, you carry pepper spray and uh, <laughs> you know, wear your U.S. kids so you can outrun anybody trying to get your camera. Rico made a, a sub mini Rico 16 that was gold and it had interchangeable lenses. So you should get one of those and you could have like a golden camera collection. Do you see any of these, Dan? Uh, we see them from time to time. They, they were not that limited edition. I mean, this is number uh, 535. I think they made a thousand of them or 950, I think was the exact. Something like that. Yeah. yeah. I have the R3 version of the same camera. Yeah, that's right. They made a reflex version of the, so the, it was, uh, uh, I think it was Barnack's 75th yeah. birthday or something like that. And they made a gold finished Leica M42 with a black and gold 50 Sumo Lux, which is what Paul's holding. And they also made an R4 and a 50 Sumo Lux set. Yeah, it, was, it was the R3 and the 100 year. Oh, R3. Yeah, it was 1879 to 1979. So, yeah. We see them from time to time that the, the it's not so easy to sell a gold like a camera. Oh, a lot of oh, people no. that want those in their collection already have them from back in the day so this was a gift i i would never have gone out and purposely bought <laughs> bought the camera it is a beautiful beautiful camera set it matches all your gold chains paul yeah my mr t starter kit yeah it matches all your all your bling i'm yeah. petty to fool <laughs> All right. Well, well, golden Leicas. Last time, Danny, Ron, we talked about the hot pink Hello Kitty Leicas. So oh, yeah. uh, our, our theme for this one are the golden Leicas. But I think that's a good spot to end the show. Dan, it is awesome having you on. Uh, I love having you on not only for your like and knowledge, but you're just an awesome speaker. People <laughs> always, you. always appreciate hearing you talk. I know I do. Uh, when, when we were trying to select someone that we wanted to invite, I mean, you were like a unanimous decision. So um, Thank thanks so for much. coming on. Oh, it's a pleasure. For the rest of the guys, like I said, we wanted to do an episode a little different from the past three where we could all just sort of sit around and do like coffee talk. So we spent a lot of time on auctions, but um, that was, I think, super informative. And I hope maybe some of the buyer beware stories might help someone listening to the show in the future. Anthony, were you trying to say something? No, I'm just... Uh... Listening for the, the, the distant drums that are, are calling for Mamiya for a future episode. Yes. So we've been kind of trying to figure out what we want to talk about for our next themed show. It seems like Mamiya is in the front running. We definitely want to do a Yashika show. I really had an idea of some special guests that we could have on that were Yashika experts, but so far haven't had much luck on it. Um, we, we're maybe going to do something specific to the Kodak retinas. 
Did somebody say Aries? You know, maybe some of the lesser known Japanese companies. We One of the ideas, we should do a panoramic show, but we spent the first third of this one talking about that. So maybe that will... Um, <laughs> <laughs> maybe that will whet that appetite you know but if you're listening to this if you're a member of the show and you guys like what we do we absolutely love the feedback we love it when people offer suggestions but i can't say this enough if you want to influence the discussions or things that we talk about join us on the show this was a closed episode we did not post the link um, but for the next one we will we will record on Monday, March 20th. For those of you in most of the world, except Theo, Daylight Savings Time begins next week. So for our friends in Australia, and uh, I don't know, I think New Zealand's probably the same way. Um, it's going to be an hour earlier. And then the next show after that, you guys get out of Daylight Savings Time. So that'll change it by an hour again, right? So you'll be two hours earlier than we normally do. That's correct. So so instead of being midday on Tuesday, the next episode will be at 11 a.m. on 11 Tuesday. 11 a.m. Yep. So look for the uh, show announcement. We typically like to get that a couple of days out before we record. You guys, thank you so much. Once again, another awesome episode. I also, I also want to just quickly add that uh, uh, over on Instagram, we have camerosity underscore podcast. And we very carefully try to uh, come up with images of all the cameras that we've been talking about. So it can, you know, often it's just like a flow of model numbers and names that are going by. If you want to go back and see what we're talking about, uh, be sure to check out Instagram. Those also auto populate over into the Facebook group, but it, it's been kind of unique in that we actually have very different audiences for the Instagram account and then for the Facebook group. And uh, we get some good comments going on both places. Uh, so if you want to see the cameras that we talk about, check us out on Instagram or join the Facebook group. Yeah, we're starting to get engagement from other sources, too. This show is actually automatically published on YouTube, and I'm starting to even get some comments there, too. So people are hearing us all over the place. Spread the word. Uh, some people call us the nerdiest film photography podcast, but you know we like to do stuff that's different, and we want to hear from you. We want to engage. We want to We want to keep the conversation going. So... Until next time, we'll see you guys later. Thanks. Good night, Dan. everybody. Thanks night again. Too, All right. Good night. Take care. Bye. And I got to admit that that I've been bursting for the last 72 hours about not saying anything about the 617. Yeah, I didn't know. Me too. Anthony and I have been following the progress of the camera from, from Ohio to, uh, oh, wow. to Gainesville. To Jacksonville. I yeah. bet you you were a little nervous, though, buying that, not knowing the problems with... I mean, granted, it's not coming from Australia, but with the problems with shipping from the Superb, to throw that at the same time, and now you've yeah. gotten it. So no, no problems there.